Okay, we will open the meeting for the TPPC, and we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which I am, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Bob Smith. I'm here. Carrera. Jose Carrera. Lucinovich. Here. Couch. David Couch. Here. Thank you. Can you hear me? Max Goodman. Yes, thank you, David. Max Goodman. I'm here. Grace Vallejo. John Crum. Here. Nick Darling. Mauer? Here. Alvarado? Here. Bias? Here. David Smith? Here. Gilbert Salina? I'm here. Here. Kersey filling in for Tiernan. Thank you, Mr. Kersey. Para, Cindy Para. Michael Navarro. Here. And Danae Alcala. Uh, Mark Heckman for Danae Alcala. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. We're good? Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll say good all out. Thank you. Public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the council on any matter not on this agenda but under the jurisdiction of the council. Council members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. May ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff report back to the council at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have any public comments? Mr. Lewis Gill, I see. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Louis Gill, uh, the airport I work is 1600 East Truxton, out on Old Edison Highway. And I gotta say this is a treat, it's been a long time since I've been out in public for something like this. <laughs> I think we all miss it. Um, I'm here to say thank you. Uh, on, in two different ways, you guys have made some funding available both to the City of Bakersfield and the County of Kern so that um, crews from the Bakersfield Homeless Center could uh, complete a debris and obstruction removal program. In that program, we're able to give people an opportunity to get back into the workforce, people that have desperately wanted a job but couldn't get hired. And then we have problems on our freeway that we just couldn't get to. And so we got a win-win out of it. And so what I want to tell you is that five days a week, we have three crews inside the city for security limits on the freeways cleaning up. They're averaging 33,000 bags of trash a year that they're pulling off. In the county, with the newer program, we only have a single crew right now, but they're averaging a thousand bags a month. Now, what I want you to know about this is that in the last several years, we've got about 387 people come through that program. Because they got jobs, 521 people were able to move into a permanent home. 317 of those were kids. Because somebody could work, could bring home on his money, they could pay their rent. 40% of the people that have come through have gone on full-time employment, better jobs, benefits, 
taking care of their people. And so you guys have helped make that possible. We needed to get the work done on our freeways, but we also have to give people an avenue to get back to work if they want to. And so um, there's more work to be done. And so the second half is just to pitch. If ever there's an opportunity, we know there's more work to be done in the county and we would love to continue to partner in this. But first and foremost, thank you. Because those decisions are changing lives. Thank you, Mr. Gill. I think everybody agrees it's a it's a win win great program uh, for everybody and really appreciate the work that you do to make it happen. Thank you. This is Councilwoman Vallejo. I came on right before Lewis started speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Julie Hodes. Welcome. Consent agenda. Any public comment on the consent agenda? Hearing none, can I have a motion? Motion. Roll call vote, please. Steve Smith? Yes. Jose Guerrero? Yes. Lucinovich? Aye. Couch? Yes. Scribner? Aye. Vallejo? Yes. Crump? Aye. Nower? Yes. Alvarado? Yes. Cryer? Yes. Pete Smith? Yes. Rayner? Mr. Rayner? Uh, yes. Percy? Yes. Nibaro? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Item 5, Federal Transportation Improvement Program, Draft Amendment Number 16, Ms. Pacheco. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Amendment number 16 includes revisions to the congestion mitigation air quality program and the transit program. The public review period ends tomorrow, November 20th. The Kern Cog Executive Director will consider approval of the amendment on November 23rd. State and federal approval is required. At this time, I ask the chair to please open the public hearing, allow for public comment, and then close the public hearing. Thank you. We will now open the public hearing. Any comments from the public? Saying none, I will close the public hearing. Thank you. Caltrans report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. It's Michael Navarro with Caltrans. Um, a few announcements before you start on the projects. I do want to uh, congratulate and thank Kern Cog for their partnership in our, our TSEP application. As we mentioned, we submitted that to CTC, and it is one of the recommended projects for approval for Segment 4C of State Route 46 for construction funding the amount of $10 million. Um, Caltrans submitted three projects here in District 6, and two of the three were awarded, one being State Route 46. And I'll say we could have done it without the support of Kern Cog and the amount of legwork they put into um prep that application early and get it ready for submittal it made our job so much easier so i just want to thank uh current cog for your partnership also announced that this week we're starting our annual move over highway safety campaign for driver awareness um just some shocking numbers that i saw when it went out was just from last year alone as far as work zone collisions in 2019 there were 7,000 work zone collisions 32 plus injury 3200 plus injuries and 53 fatalities so it's something we want a message we really want to get out to the motoring public is that a lot of incidents happen in the work zone. So we want to encourage people to move over and be aware of the uh, the workers along the state highway system. Um, as far as projects, Cash Creek Bridge replacement. Uh, this project is anticipated to finish up this month. Uh, scheduled work for November, just clean up, removing the ESA fences and uh, final striping and hydro seed. 
the uh, gap closure project, the State Route uh, 58 Roadway Rehab Project, work scheduled for November as long as the eastbound lanes are smoothness and grinding, some small repair and striping of signs. Uh, along the westbound construction activities include some roadway activation and HMA pavement and concrete work. Uh, most of that work will occur in nighttime hours and anticipated to uh, completion in March, uh, spring of next year. Uh, Bell Terrace Overcrossing, this project is constructing an auxiliary lane and replacing the bridge. Uh, currently scheduled completion date for this is, is end of February. Uh, CRCP construction is ongoing for the aux lane as well as some utility work in the project area. Uh, Bakersfield Freeway uh, Connector, this is modifying the State Route 58 and 99 interchange. Currently scheduled for completion uh, end of 2021. Uh, work is in progress on this project with most of the work uh, continuing to be structure work. Uh, the State Route 99 uh, freight corridor, this is from I-5 to US 99 overcrossing. Work is in progress here and uh, traffic is split into lane one and three while work is being completed behind K-Rail in the number two lane. A uh, majority of this work will be completed at night as well under lane closures. State Route 99 a rehab project, this is Palm Avenue overcrossing to Beardsley Canal Bridge. Uh, work's ongoing. Northbound traffic is shifted to the outside lanes and work is being on lowering the freeway under Mink Whisper overhead and the airport drive overcrossing. Estimated completion of this project is August of 2021. The State Route 223 Derby signal project, the safety project on the east end of town. Uh, this project has an open bid date in December. And we expect to have the uh, project approved, the construction contract approved in February of next year. And we think this project will go to construction uh, early summer once the contractor has procured all the materials in the signal system. State Route 46 Poplar Cap M. This, all the striping operations are complete, as well as the crosswalk we discussed before. Uh, we anticipate the RFB, the Rapid uh, Rectangular Flashing Beacon equipment, to be delivered uh, end of this month, early December. Uh, will be installed in December, which will finalize and complete that project. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. So, Chair, thank you. Any questions? I have a question. Um, on uh, crosswalk over there and Valley Acres off of uh, 119, um, I drive through there quite a bit, and at nighttime, you can't really see the crosswalk at all or anybody walking it's so dark there. Uh, do you see anything in the future there that correct that, or is there an issue on your opinion? I want to say it's not an issue. Obviously, pedestrian crosswalk visibility is extremely important. Um, this is the first thing brought to my attention, but I'd be happy to reach out to my uh, traffic investigations team and have them do a, a either a field visit or evaluate that location to see if something we could do with whether it's signage or lighting or, or uh, reflective striping, et cetera. But, you said a crosswalk near Valley Acres on State Route 119? Yes. Okay. I'd be happy to look into that. It goes from uh, the east side across to the market there, Valley Acres Market. There's a how we uh, use quite a bit there. And, and I apologize. I can't hear who's talking. I'm sorry. Uh, Oracle Cryer. Oracle Cryer, Mayor from Tennessee to Cass. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be sure to look into that for you. Thank you. Any other comments? District 9? Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Hello, yes, hello. You. Okay, good. So, yeah. this is report for District 9. Um, the TSEP Trade Corridor Enhancement Program, the, they were announced this week. Unfortunately, District 9's uh, truck climbing lane on State Route 58 for the environmental component only was not recommended for to move forward. So um, that came kind of as a blow to us. Um, also, good news are zero emission vehicle charging station at Boron is soon going to be ready to go. This would be at the rest area in Boron. Uh, regarding Mojave Maintenance Station, we're still awaiting the state fire marshal to do the final inspection, but that should be coming to a close any day now. Uh, the For construction, the Rosamund Mojave Rehab Project, 
There will be a lane closure on the northbound lanes starting next week. That's going to occur Monday through Friday during the day, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., but there will be no work during the nighttime. Um, and then we have another project, which is the Kern Bridge Maintenance Project. This is the one that's going on at Cameron County, or Canyon, and that's on State Route 58 about uh, at exit 156. This is kind of where the Pacific Crest Trail crosses State Route 58. Crews are going to be working on both the eastbound and westbound lanes, and there may be lane closures through the work zone with minimal delays. And yeah. Most of that work will probably occur overnight, but just be cognizant that that's occurring. And that's the completed report for District 9. Do you have any questions? Uh, this is Joel Smith, Pat Pete. I have a question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, regarding your uh, comment, that was the truck climbing lane the environmental document that has been delayed. Well, we applied for trade corridor money on that to just complete the environmental component of the project. And uh, at this point, you know, we're still looking at how we're going to fund the environmental portion of it, but uh, if the TSEP application was not successful. But it's still a project. Okay, uh, how do we keep, the, it's still a project, uh, how much of a delay does this cause? I mean. Uh, it could, it just depends upon when we get funded for the environmental component right now. Um, We've tried CMAC funding. We've tried uh, TCP, Trade Corridor Enhancement. Uh, we're looking at possibly funding it through our shop program. So we'll see. I think I think shop funds uh, would be uh, uh, a viable alternative since these others have failed. Uh, but I'd like yeah. to keep that in the forefront uh, on your mind uh, for shop funds. Uh, to be utilized for this. That's just, that's the, my opinion. Thank you. Uh, we are in agreement. Thank you. Hey, uh, this is Zach, um, Supervisor Scrivener. Hey, uh, uh, Phil, I, I share your concern on this. I'd like to ask for Aaron to coordinate a, um, a virtual meeting conference call whatever between you and me and him and then a subsequent discussion with caltrans and any other uh relevant agencies or elected officials uh offices because i want to make sure we stay on top of this so aaron can you make that happen thank you zach uh, this Appreciate is this is Councilwoman Vallejo in Delano. When when the application for the funding was submitted, did we have any lobbying for that? Did anybody lobby on our behalf? Uh, for well, District this, 9? This is Zach. Sorry, go ahead. My... Uh, typically, Caltrans is kind of prohibited from lobbying for uh funds because this is coming out of the ctc so um usually that would kind of be handled by somebody else well this is zach again supervisor scrivener um just to get perspective i mean this is an, a very expensive project you know you've got mountains on one side and a big drop off on the other you know it's not a cheap cheap uh you know lift here but uh mayor smith and i from Tatchby as well as the officials in Tatchby, Greg Pope with the county, Aaron, we've all been we've all been riding herd on this issue for a long time. Nobody as long as Phil. And so it's you know it's a tough thing to you know to try to get this funding allocated, but I think that everybody recognizes the need, particularly because that trade corridor continues to be more and more utilized, the frustration of travelers in dealing with the truck traffic going west to east gets more and more uh pronounced um and so it's 
it's a tough thing to get funded, but there's a lot of people that are pulling on the same side of the rope to get it done. And Zach, we're talking about just the the uh, the money for the environmental review, not the actual project. Um, is that correct, or or, or are we yeah. talking about the lots and lots of money for the whole I'm, project? I'm, that, my that comments were this stuff for the whole project but you know but it is you know it's you know we know it's a um you know it's a question of, of priorities and how we get this prioritized and in the queue um from caltrans perspective but um there's a lot of people who have identified this as a as a major priority for the county um, because not only just our local residents, but because of what this corridor means for um, for trade and commerce. And so uh, we need to, I think we need to powwow, as I said, um, amongst the, the county officials. And then I'd like to move on with a conversation, not only with Caltrans, but also with our state and federal elected officials that I'm sure recognize this as a priority as well. I agree. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then, uh, I have a question on the, uh, the overpass at San Canyon Road in 58. What would be the anticipated completion of that bridge? Uh, I'm not sure on that one. I'll have to get back to you. Who was asking about that one, by the way? Uh, Orphan from City of Town. Okay, right. uh, we all in that area there, uh, wide equipment and stuff, and a lot of times our equipment's too wide. And other other companies, Grimway, Bullhouse, same issue, uh, flow through there when the roads are open uh, without restriction. All right. Thank you. I will find out and get back to this board. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you. Executive Director's Report. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. I have uh, several items for this uh, agenda. Uh, CTC met uh, October 21st and 22nd. I'm pleased to announce that California City and Maricopa's uh, road maintenance and rehabilitation funds were funded. Uh, all the other cities and the county were funded uh, back in August. Uh, in, on November 4th, the CTC, uh, California Air Resources Board, and Housing and Community Development um, met um, virtually. On December 2nd and 3rd, the CTC is scheduled to meet um, virtually again. And uh, as both uh, Caltrans reps uh, have commented on, they will act on uh, a recommendation that was released uh, this Monday on several projects that are of interest to us. Uh, the first one is State Route 46, um, just west of Lost Hills, where staff is recommending $10 million um, to be put on uh, Project 4C, which is the final three miles of converting Route 46 to um, four lanes in Kern County. That's great news for Kern County. The next item is the recommendation to fund the San Luis Obispo portion is also recommended at $7.3 million. However, that funding is for right-of-way, not for construction. The $10 million um, in Kern County is for construction. And as we uh, just discussed, the truck climbing lanes on Route 58 requested $5.7 million for environmental work, and that staff is not recommending that that project be funded. Uh, I have talked to the Caltrans District 9 director, as well as the Caltrans director himself, which I'll get to in a minute. And uh, we are working together to potentially fund the environmental work for one of the three locations, if you all remember, the, the uh, truck climbing lanes have three locations. 
we're working to fund the steepest portion. I can't remember what number, whether that was one, two, or three. I think it might be two uh, using shop funds. However, it is uh, a work in progress, um, and we do do not have uh, a definite thumbs up yet. But, but that's the direction we, we are heading in. We are certainly not giving up on that just because we did not get this money. We are um, working actively to keep the project moving. And, and District uh, 9 Director is uh, being, being very helpful and is committed to figuring out a way to get that project through the next phase. On December 10th and 11th, um, California Air Resources Board is scheduled to meet, and they are scheduled to select another AB 617 community. Arvin is uh, in the running, so uh, please uh, please uh, weigh in on the fact that um, uh, Shafter was already selected. Arvin continually has the worst there in the Central Valley. It's time that uh, Arvin be selected as an AB 617 community. Over the uh, past month since we last met, I've had uh, several meetings uh, over the San Joaquin Valley Inland Port Project. I had a very uh, promising meeting with, with the county, Caltrans, um, Council Member uh, Smith from Patchfield also attended about some new developments on the Edward Air Force Base North Gate connection to Cal City Boulevard. There, there are at least two, uh, potentially three developers that are planning on working um, at that interchange. And we are actively working to get all parties uh, to work towards a common goal, which is eliminating the at grade intersection at California City Boulevard and 58. And um, I'll pause for a second and see if uh, Council Member Smith from Dashby wants to comment on that meeting. Yes, thank you, Aaron. Yes, uh, uh, I would draw everyone's attention. Uh, go to Google Maps or on your uh, laptop or iPhone or anything at any time. Uh, the intersection in question is at Highway 58 and California City Boulevard. And the importance of this intersection is it is currently at grade. And we have several hundred, if not a couple of thousand folks that work at Edwards Air Force Base in the civilian side and on the military side, many of whom uh, live in Cal City. So they are impacted heavily with uh, uh, traversing an at-grade crossing to get onto 58 to travel 2.5 miles, 2.3 miles down to the north gate entrance of Edwards Air Force Base. And then in the evening, you've got a. Uh, it's a little different because they can uh, they go over a, a, at, the, at Edwards. There is an, an overpass there. And on their way home, they can make a right-hand turn. But on the on the early hours, you've got to uh, you've got an at-grade crossing. And I would point out uh, that Highway 58 is considered a highway. Uh, we have, I think, only two remaining at-grade crossings. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron. It's this one, and then there are actually three uh, at Caliente Bill Bill Road which is approximately 20 miles west of Tehachapi. And then at uh, Highway 223, the Arvin uh, cutoff uh, off of 58, where there's also an at-grade crossing uh, to head toward Arvin. But this would eliminate one uh, at-grade crossing for a, I think, I'm not sure what we were talking about, a few a few million dollars at, at at one point they were throwing out uh, about five or six million dollars, which the area is basically flat. There's not going to be a lot of uh, earth moving. Uh, but the, if we could get the developers to assist with the the flow of traffic uh, at their area at uh, Northgate Boulevard. Uh, so if you could just Google it sometime, you could see that that is an at grade crossing on a very busy 
Highway 58 with truck traffic and everything, and you've got to cross four lanes to get to work. So if we could work with developers and uh, and get that, it would become a frontage road on the north side, and then we would eliminate that uh, intersection, and it would be moved 2.3 miles to the east, uh, where it makes a lot of sense. And it would be a win-win for all, for just about everybody over there. So just drawing your attention to it. I'm hoping that, uh, you know, folks in the Central Valley that use 58, you're going east to Vegas or uh, points east, uh, you will cross that intersection and you'll be, uh, if it's a certain time of day, you'll be uh, seeing people uh, coming across and having to uh, traverse that. So. Just bringing that up now, if we can get this moved along, it's in early stages with the developers, but uh, just want to draw your attention to it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, a few more items. Um, Bakersfield, Shafter, the county, Kerncog, Caltrans, and High Speed Rail are working uh, together better than ever on our cargo study. And we are about to um, move into the second phase of that in the next uh, few months. I'm, I'm, I participated in several meetings on that. Um, good news from, from all agencies. We also met with the Bakersfield Homeless Center and City of Bakersfield and County of Kern over um, homeless issues and uh, illegal dumping issues. Also had a meeting with Caltrans staff in District 6 over their 10-year shop plan. Um, I'm also um, very happy to announce that bids opened on Highway 46 for the 4B project. That's the project that goes from the commercial area near I-5 uh, through the community of Lost Hills and ends just west of the aqueduct. Bids were opened November 5th and came in $2 million low, which represents about a 10% 10 uh, 10 savings. Also during the month, I met with um, Tokes Omashakin, the Caltrans director, and the District 6 director, Diana Gomez, regarding uh, our TCEP applications um, for Lost Hill, the truck climbing lanes, and uh, also the San Luis Obispo uh, TCEP <laughs> application. We also talked about uh, environmental issues that I uh, brought up several times. He's committed to working on the uh, environmental issues with me in District 6, and that's good news. And uh, I um, thanked him profusely for the $10 million, $10 million award, and we will continue to uh, press on the Highway 58 truck climbing lanes. One more item I, I want to uh, mention. There were truck climbing lanes funded by the Trade Corridor Program. They were funded for Interstate 10. Um, so, so I'm convinced, so is the Caltrans director, so is the District 9 director, that this is a good project that will eventually get some funding. We just need to work together to keep the project going. Uh, that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman, subject to any of your questions. Thank you. Any questions for the director? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Hakimi, and the TPPC meeting is adjourned, and we will open the current college meeting, uh, same roll call, we added Mr. Barola. <laughs> and Vallejo. Uh, any public comments for this meeting? Seeing none, consent agenda public comments. Seeing none, can I have a motion? motion. This is Raina, move to approve. Second, this is Vallejo. Second. Call vote, please. Steve Smith? Yes. Gorilla? Yes. Kinovich? Aye. Pouch? Yes. Scribner? Aye. Leo? Yes. Uh -huh. 
Mallard? Yes. Alvarado? Yes. Fryer? Yes. Philip Smith? Yes. And Raina? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Item four, Kern Cog's 2020 Regional Award of Merit Ceremony, Ms. Napier. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of, of the board. Uh, Kern Cog understands the concerns of social gatherings surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic in preparation for the 2020 Kern Cog Regional Award of Merit Ceremony that was scheduled to be held or is scheduled to be held March 4th um, of 2021. Staff wants to take into consideration the safety concerns of our board and community members. Staff usually begins planning for the regional award ceremony during the first week of November each year. Due to the safety concerns, that process has been put on hold until the board has a chance to weigh in. I have attached to the staff report two checklists, one representing the normal planning process, which again usually begins um, around, right around November 1st and one representing a compressed process in case you want to go forward with the um, March event. With all this in mind, staff is proposing the following options for board consideration. Cancel the 2020 Kern Cog Regional Awards event scheduled for March 4th, 2021 and combine it with the 2021 ceremony to be held in March of 2022. Postpone the 20 Kern Cog Regional Awards to later in the year to give staff time to coordinate and wait to see how the pandemic is evolving. Keep in mind that with that postponement, the League of California Cities meeting is scheduled for September 22nd through 24th, and the CSAC annual meeting is scheduled for November 30th to December 3rd, so we should not um, schedule it during those times. Try to plan some type of virtual regional award ceremony, which we have never done and could be problematic, but we would try. Plan for the in-person event, scheduled event for March 4th, 2021, and move forward with the call for entries to be due the 14th of December. The staff is just looking for your recommendations and comments. Thank you. So any initial comments from members? This is Zach Scrivener, um, Chairman Smith. I, I would defer to you quite a bit on this just based on the fact that you have to um, officiate everything and you work closely with staff to do it. But from my perspective, I think combining is problematic because these usually go pretty long as it is. Um, I would suggest we consider shooting for an August date, um, knowing that we're, you know, we're often dark in either July or August, so shoot for a date somewhere maybe in August to postpone it, and then uh, but still have a deadline of January 31 for nominations, et cetera. So um, you know, still fresh in people's minds who should be nominated for their efforts and achievements in 2020. But um, once again, I'm sure you've given this some th some thoughts that you're going to have to. Um, potentially run it if we do it this year, uh, or I'm sorry, in, in, 20, in 2021 at some point. Is that, am I right on that as far as the timeline for your chairmanship? Because I, I know that. Thank you, Supervisor. I, I asked Aaron about that the other day and I'm, I'm not sure exactly when I end up. Uh, your, your chairmanship will be up sometime this spring. Okay, in the spring, so. Uh, might be somebody else by then, or, or maybe I'll be up again. Who knows? But I, I concur with your your comment, Supervisor. Uh, I was thinking, uh, yeah, August, September, even October would be nice. I, I think combining them is problematic just because of the length, and uh, it's always a great event, and and we have a lot of people in the county doing great work, and it's always good to recognize them. And hopefully, you know, August, September, October will be mostly past uh, COVID. I, I, my my thought process, if I may, and then I'll be finished, was that if we if we shot for August 
you know, late July or August, it would have enough separation from then until the following March. Uh, so, you know, it would, you know, we wouldn't, it wouldn't feel like they were jammed together so much, you know, cause there would be quite a few months in between if we moved it into the, into the, you know, the, the, the fall, uh, to late fall, if, you know, it might feel like they were, you know, too pushed together. And I think we're going to know a heck of a lot more about this virus in the later part of the summer. Um, you know, hopefully a lot of good things happen as far as the therapeutics and the, and the vaccine, et cetera. But doing it any sooner than that, I think is, uh, you know, it's going to be risky. But I, but as far as the deadline for applications and selection, I think we should still try to keep that somewhere close to the first part of, of 2021 in January, late January, February. And that's it for, for my comments. But, uh, you know, look to others for, you know, for guidance. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, this is great. Grace Vallejo. Um, I, I concur about the combination because um that would be late into the night i would think doubling the amount of of uh wardies that are uh, that are receiving uh whatever award they're, they're going to be presented with my only concern would on on uh, picking it out to july august and maybe not a, so much concern as turning to staff to ask what will they do for the preparation i i, I don't want to push so much close together because they're going to prepare for August, we'll say. And when it's over, how soon do they have to start preparing for the following year uh, award, or for that year award, I should say, the 21? Yeah, typical is November when they get started. Okay, and uh, staff is comfortable with uh, ending one, let's say, in August and then doing the November one preparation? I'm getting nods, yes. We, we work for the board. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I understand that, but the way I feel about staff, like even here in Delano, it's yes, they do work for us, but I like to consider their, them too because, you know, they work hard for us, I guess I should say, because if they're comfortable with that, I think that one would, in my opinion, would be um, the best solution. That way we take care of 2020 in August of 2021. And then in and then we get ready for 2021 at the latter part of the winter. Hopefully, if this pandemic is not stretching all the way until winter of of 2021. It, uh, That's it. If, if I may add, um, to, to do two in one year, you would see an increase in that work element for two regional award programs. Um, while we do recoup some funds from the cost of the bidders, we, we do not recoup everything that, that the, the events um, cost us, and it is all local funds. So um, I just want you to have all, all of that. Um, can we do two in one year? Absolutely, if that's what the board wants us to do. Um, we do have, maybe I'm saying too much. <laughs> we do have a lot on our plate right now. We have the art, the 2022 RTP that's going to be in full swing um, next summer. And uh, so because we're, I mean, we'll be in 2021 and it'll be supposed to be adopted in uh, June of 2022. Um, and again, that requires uh, the arena process as well, which we didn't have in 2018. So th those are just, you know, two of the things that, that are on tap plate right now as well. But, you know, the regional awards will pull it off if that's what you want. Thank you. And, and I'm sure uh, staff, I'm sure staff would do that, but it does bother me that we're loading so much, you know, uh, in that year, because we're thinking this event, but as as Becky was saying right now, they have more than just this event that they're going to be dealing with in 2021. And that would be my consideration that how much are we going to load on them besides everything else they're having to deal with? This is, I'm sorry. I said it was pretty. 
I'm sorry, yeah, Grace. Sure. I didn't mean to cut you off. This, this is Zach. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I said I wouldn't say anything more, so I apologize. I, I didn't hold up my end of the bargain, but I'm confused. <laughs> if, if this, if normally we, were, if normally we were going to hold this event in March of 2021 for the 2020 awards, and we're talking about pushing it to August, and then having the 2021 awards in March of 2022 to get back on schedule. If, what am I missing here? How are we loading two in one year? The, the money would be the same. It's a fiscal year from uh, July 1 to June 30th. So we would have, if you're going to have it in August, we would have to fund it in the 21-22 fiscal year. You have to okay. fund Okay. So, okay. I, I I appreciate that. Now I understand what it is you're saying. Okay. So what? Could we look at June? And that keeps it in the fiscal year as long as it's before the end of June, right? If we're it, talking it, yeah, about it, fiscal it, year, then. It, it does, great. It's just I was wondering if that's enough time for us to be able to evaluate where we are with the virus and being able to hold events. I was thinking the farther we pushed out into the summer, it, that might be beneficial. But I, but in light of the fiscal year issue, um, I would, I would uh, adjust my suggestion to say, you know, let's look somewhere in late June and uh, with the fiscal year starting July, July 1. And then, um, and then if you know if things are are not uh are not going our way as far as the virus spread et cetera, then we may have to adjust at that point but um if we tried to if we tried to plan to do it somewhere in mid to late June, then you know I think that's responsible at this point and I agree with with what Zach is saying uh, um now that we're talking about fiscal year and financial part of it um my worry too would be we have no idea what's going to happen you know with the pandemic and and uh, worst case scenario would be that we have to end up doing what all other organizations have done and totally cancel a certain event if june comes around and we can't do it we would just have to cancel 2020 and concentrate on 2021. can we get a comment from uh Harkini on the fiscal analysis if the if the board comes to a consensus, we can plan for an event in the summer, and we will keep you updated whether it's going to be June, July, August, or September. Uh, and we will continue to keep you updated if that's your desire. Um, the the fact that we have two in one fiscal year, we, that's an, uh, we can easily overcome that. Appreciate that. So I I think what I'm hearing you say is. If we, want, if we want to make a motion and give direction to staff, perhaps not tying it down to a specific date or month uh, to give you flexibility, that works better. Yes, that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Any other comments from members? Yes, this is Jose Gurola from Marvin. I I think it's it's prudent to to wait. Uh, any time in the summer is a good. You know I. To be honest, I think it's you know very arbitrary to decide whether it's June, July, or August. Um, I think any of those dates will work, will work as long as you were cleared with um, public health guidance and, and the status of the virus. And I think staff's capable of um, handling the situation and, and, and putting, on a, putting on a good event as they always do, regardless of what, what the date we set is going to be. Thank you. And this is Mike Maurer, Hi. Rich Christ. I would concur with uh, having it uh, directing staff to plan it sometime in the summer. Uh, this is Gil Reyna, okay. and I, I concur with that decision too. And I believe staff a recommendation is to let them decide where it might be feasible to have it based on the condition of the pandemic. So uh, I am fine with having it uh, sometime where, where it would be possible to have it, whether it be June, July, August, September. Now, this is great. I have a question then. I'm a little confused. Was it the, uh, because the, to me, the when doesn't matter if 
staff is okay with it. But I thought there was a concern about the fiscal year and the budget. We we can over, overcome that. We we are uh, financially capable of, of uh, amending our budget and and taking out the money we don't spend this year and moving into next year's budget. Budget sub, obviously subject to board's approval. There's flexibility there. Okay, if if the flexibility on the budget is there, then then I I would go back to Zach's suggestion that if staff is looking at things are good, having it either July or August. And if, if the fi financial side of it, the fiscal budget is, is good with that, then fine. We, we don't need necessarily a motion, Mr. Chairman, but, but I, I, I would appreciate some, some uh, if there is a consensus, and it sounds like there is, uh, you're, you're welcome to, um, Ask if there's consensus. I, I, was, I would recommend. I, I I believe I'm hearing consensus, and so I will state what I believe I've heard uh, that we postpone the event until sometime in the summer and give staff flexibility uh, depending on uh, number one their workload and number two you know how how the pandemic is going or with both of those and and try and work it out sometime in the Chair summer. Chairman Smith, this is oh, back this is, again. This do, is, we, do we need to do we need to make some kind of a determination as far as the deadline for submission of nominees and the you know and the committee work to go through those nominations? If if we don't, fine. But if, if staff is looking to us to set a deadline, I just ask if that if that needs to be done. Uh, Supervisor Scribner will we'll set the deadline in January and well, January or February and we will set up a uh, uh, ad hoc committee. Um, I'll, I'll probably send out an email or, or uh, Ms. Napier will since we are uh, likely to not meet next month. and. Uh, Solicit volunteers and ha have that meeting within a week or two of, of when the deadline is. Uh, as we usually do, we'll compile all the applicants, um, put them in uh, what we think are appropriate categories, and then that ad hoc uh, group can meet in January or February and we'll likely schedule it uh, maybe before uh, our board meeting. Thank you. I, I think that's kind of the direction, unless I hear something different. Mr. Chairman, it, it, would, it would seem to me that really the, the, the most difficult uh, decision to be made is not when to do it, but when to make a decision you can't do it. So in other words, if you schedule June, July, or August, it's a question of at what point can you do you have to make the decision that we can't we can't move forward given the environment that we're living in living with, and, and that may be more critical than anything else. And that's something that staff is going to have to bring back to us as part of this uh, ad hoc committee that you would form. It would seem to me, I just want to make sure that, that we, we make sure that that that's really the, the biggest question we have about whether we do it this year or not. Yeah, Ms. Ms. Napier will. Uh, Either through me or, or by herself uh, at every meeting between now and when uh, when we potentially have the awards, we'll give monthly updates on progress, whether we can actually get a venue or not, and of course, you know, whether we're purple, red, or, or orange. Um, and at, at a certain point, there, there will be a, a point where we'll pull the trigger yes or no and obviously if it gets worse we, we can uh, cancel it up to the day of the event if we have to. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. It's okay, kind of hard to make decisions when it's out of our hands. <laughs> yeah I think we've given direction and then we'll maintain flexibility and uh, hopefully we can make it happen. Uh, executive director's report. 
Good evening again, Mr. Chairman. I just have um, one quick item on this agenda. I electronically signed our Clean Mobility Options Voucher Pilot Program Agreement for um, outreach for um, bicycling uh, in disadvantaged communities, and we should receive our notice to proceed on that um, shortly. As a reminder, that was a, about a $50,000 uh, grant we received. And finally, in your folder tonight is um, the report for the Trade Carter Enhancement Program staff recommendations, where you can see the um, $10 million that is uh, being recommended that we receive, 7.3 for San Luis Obispo County on State Route 46, the 5.7 that was not recommended for approval on. Uh, State Route 58 truck climbing lanes, and you can also cruise the list and, and see what types of projects were recommended for funding. Um, and please take a look if, if you are interested in the uh, truck climbing lanes on Interstate 10. Uh, schedule of cash disbursements for October, timeline covering November through February. And uh, that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman, subject to any of your questions. Any questions for the director? Hearing none, then I will move to presentation of CLAC. We have Mr. Greg Palamo, who has stuck with Turn Cloud for 25 years, and we appreciate that. And we'd we'll like to thank him for one of the best days. So thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it, Aaron. Becky and the board keep it neat. Thanks. I bet you I don't forget what you're at your phone call. <laughs> Thank you. And that's it. And meeting will be adjourned. <laughs>